for coming to the um, ACLU of Rhode Island 2023 Legislative Wrap-Up. Um, we're really excited to have you all. Um, this is our first in-person wrap-up since COVID, so <laughs> thank you so much for coming out. <laughs> and uh, bear with us if if we're a little if we're a little clumsy, we're still getting used to having in-person events again. But we're really really happy that you all joined us tonight. Um, my name is Hannah Stern. I'm the policy associate at the ACLU of Rhode Island, and one of our two lobbyists, along with Stephen Brown, our executive director. Um, oh yay! <laughs> Just in time. <laughs> um, I just want to thank the Cranston Public Library for um, letting us use this space tonight. Um, I also want to thank our donors who donated the food that you see on the back table. Um, so a huge thank you to Seven Stars, a huge thank you to Trader Joe's, and a huge thank you as well to PBD Donuts. Um, and then I also want to thank um, Rep Cruz and Rep Agello for being here tonight to talk about our legislative session with us. Um, just some very brief housekeeping notes. There are bathrooms in the library, as you would probably expect. <laughs> um, they are right outside the door to the left. Please don't hesitate if you need to go outside to go outside. There's also water over there. Um, please also feel free during the event if you want more food or drinks or anything, please feel free to go to the back table. Um, just another quick note, this event is being recorded. So if you ask any questions or make any particularly excited noises, it will be on camera, <laughs> so just keep that in mind. Um, we also would ask that, if possible, that you just hold all questions to the end. Um, I know that this is uh, this that there's a lot of thrilling topics that we're going to talk about. There's probably a lot of questions that are going to come from that, but we just ask we will have a pretty long question and answer portion at the end. So if you're able to hold it till then, we would really appreciate it. Um, and then just really briefly, I just want to introduce the rest of our staff. So like I said, I'm Hannah Stern, I'm the policy associate. We have Stephen Brown, our executive director. Um, we have Zoe Chikoyan, who is our, our technical director for the night and also our communications associate. Um, we have Maggie Cachadorian, who's our assistant to the director. And then we also have Monica Smith, who is our development associate. And then I've introduced myself, I've introduced Stephen Brown, but I also want to introduce and Thank so much for being here tonight to talk about uh, the 2023 legislative session, Representative Edith Agello from House District 1, and then Representative Cherie Cruz from House District 58. Um, we're really excited to have everyone here today. Um, this was a, a pretty interesting session, so there's a lot of, I think, fun bills to talk about. Um, I hope everyone else agrees. <laughs> hope everyone else is as enthusiastic as I am about this. So, Let's just very briefly go through what the legislative session looked like for the ACLU before we go into sp some specific bills. And just to give some context to kind of the breadth of our work, the number of bills that we tracked um, this year, in just 2023, was over 1,000 bills. So we tracked 1,048 pieces of legislation. Um, and again, I really bring up this number just because I think it reflects how many areas civil liberties touches. Um, I think that Steve would probably agree with me that we get a lot of questions from people where people are like, why are you commenting on this bill? Why are you testifying on this bill? What are you doing in Senate Commerce today? Like, why are you here? But I think the reality is that civil liberties is a very broad topic. Um, there are a lot of things that that falls under. And the reality is that a lot of the bills that go through the legislature do impact civil liberties in one way or another, um, even if you know, they're really discreet. We go into committees and we testify on things where there's one Open Meetings Act issue in a bill that's 65 pages long and it's buried on page 55. So we really do look at the minutia, but that's why we have to track this many bills. And from those bills that we track, we actually lobbied on over 350, so 353 pieces of legislation this year. Um, that was with our two lobbyists, with our volunteers who um, occasionally lobby on our behalf, but again, I don't bring this up necessarily to like brag about the amount of work that Steve and I do, although maybe I should. Um, but again, to just show how many pieces of legislation actually going through our legislature impact civil liberties in some really measurable way. So one of the really interesting things about this session is actually probably about what died rather than what passed. This was one of those sessions where a lot of really good bills died, but also a lot of really bad bills died. So we're just gonna start it off by talking about a few of the really positive pieces of legislation that 
we lobbied on behalf of that we think should have passed that unfortunately did not. And I'm gonna ask uh, Steve to start us off with I think a very exciting topic. I hope, I think we can convince you that open records are a very uh, thrilling, <laughs> a thrilling topic by the end of, <laughs> by the end of Steve's okay. speech. That, thank you, Matt. It would have been more thrilling if this bill had passed, but it didn't. Um, <laughs> this is a bill that is, uh, was worked on by a coalition, there's a, an open government coalition called Access Rhode Island um, that has been working for many years on open government issues. And more specifically, open, the Open Meetings Law and the Access to Public Records Act. And um, this year, uh, we put in, uh, with uh, the help of sponsors, obviously, and particularly Senate, uh, Senator Louis De Palma, uh, who was really um, eager to get legislation passed to um, amend the Open Records Law in a variety of ways. Uh, there were about 40 different amendments that this bill included to try to strengthen, clarify, and reform our open records law. It's been over a decade since um, there's been any sort of major reform to that law, and in that time, we've seen plenty of loopholes, um, lots of things missing, uh, lots of problems with individuals, the media, and others being able to gain uh, easy access to um, public information. And this bill was designed to address a whole range of those issues. Uh, just to give a few quick examples, one major change had to do with the cost of obtaining records. Uh, it's often quite a burden, um, the way that public bodies charge individuals for finding records and providing them. This bill would have uh, significantly changed and limited the cost that could be imposed on members of the public seeking access to records. Um, it also would require public bodies to be much more specific uh, when they denied a record as to why they were denying it. Um, sometimes you just get these sort of blanket um, rejections and you don't have a good idea of exactly what it is that prompted the, the denial. And this bill would have, would have made it much harder for those sort of generic responses. And one final thing I just want to mention, which was sort of low key, but a really big one, is it would have um, required all public bodies um, to um, post online with their agendas, the documents that they would be discussing at a meeting. Um, you know, we just did a report on post-COVID actions by municipal <coughs> bodies, and that was one of the issues we looked at. This bill would have addressed that. We thought it was very important. Well, not surprisingly, a bill like this, making these sorts of reforms to the Open Records Law, will come. were not uh, the favorites of public bodies themselves. Um, there was a tremendous range of opposition uh, particularly from the, the state executive branch and, and many of the state agencies. Um, also not surprising, there were a number of changes designed to make police records more accessible and police departments uh, were quite agitated about that. Um, the Sen Senator De Palma worked very hard to try to get all the parties together to try to work something out, um, but as often happens, um, time ran out and um, the bill ended up uh, dying without a vote in, in either the Senate or the House. But um, the coalition and Senator De Palma are continuing to work um, in the off season to talk with um, those who are opposed to the legislation to see if we can work some of these issues out. And uh, we hope to be back very strong next year. I mean, we are really pressing for passage of this bill in 2024. Uh, and I think with the support of legislators like Senator De Palma and the large coalition that was working on it, uh, you know, I think there's a good chance that we'll be able to do that. Thank you so much, Steve. I know that was, this is definitely one of those really important bills that I think might kind of fly under the radar, but is definitely one of the really huge priorities for the ACLU as an organization that is a huge proponent of open government. Um, so I'm actually gonna talk about the next piece of legislation, which if you've ever come to our wrap-ups or uh, <laughs> read any of our literature, you've probably read about because this is also a huge priority piece of legislation for the ACLU, which is actually a piece of legislation which addresses school computer privacy. Um, what this bill would have done is it would have given students using school loaned computers and devices very basic privacy protections. This is an issue that the ACLU of Rhode Island has been involved with for a very long time. Um, when schools started giving out um, iPads and Chromebooks especially to students, we were kind of concerned. Uh, we were like, what 
are you, what privacy protections are you also giving these students on these school loan computers that often these students are required to use as a way of completing their education? Um, and I also want to say, this is also a very important issue that is not just kind of one that we dreamed of and um, are really pursuing, but it's one where literally every August and September, um, all of our staff members can attest to this, we get so many phone calls from parents who want to know the same thing. You know, they want to know, my student has just been given this Chromebook, what privacy protections can I expect my student to have while they're using these devices? And unfortunately, the answer that we have to keep giving them is there are none statutorily. Um, we pretty regularly actually examine these pol the policies that districts put in place because um, as of right now, because there is no statute, students and parents are relying on a patchwork of district policies um, for these Chromebooks and different school loan devices. Um, some of these districts give students pretty robust privacy protections, a lot of them do not. Um, so one of, the, one of the few factors that we look at uh, very specifically is do these policies, do these policies uh, restrict a, a district or a school from accessing the microphone or camera of a school loan device? Um, again, a very basic privacy protection that you would really take for granted. But what we found is that actually a majority of districts in the state do not protect students from this type of intrusion. Um, and it's the same thing if we look at whether uh, schools are restricting the ability to access the location of a school loan device. So if a school is wondering, you know, like, where a student is completing their homework um, or where they're maybe, uh, you know, maybe where they're accessing their class resources. There are very few districts that actually provide protections from schools just accessing this information without um, really any reason for it. Um, this was very concerning to us. This piece of legislation would put in place those two very basic uh, privacy protections. So again, making sure that schools are really limited, limited in their ability to access the camera or microphone of a school loan device. Um, you know, limited to instances where the student is actually uh, activating it themselves for educational purposes, for example. Um, and the same with the location services. Again, these are very basic privacy protections. This is also one of those pieces of legislation that we really kind of tout as being very proactive, right? Um, thankfully, we have not heard, heard of a situation in Rhode Island where a student has had their privacy violated in uh, this way, but we know of instances in other states uh, there was a very famous example actually in Pennsylvania a few years ago where a school was actually found to have tried to discipline a student based off photos they took of that student in his bedroom while he was asleep through the camera of his school loan computer. Um, they accused him of having uh, narcotics in his room. He did not. Uh, there was a huge lawsuit over that. So this is really one of those pieces of legislation that we have been um, that we've been really trying to push this very proactive legislation, a very simple piece of legislation just to put those very basic privacy protections in place. Um, this legislation actually passed the House unanimously. Um, Representative June Speakman was the uh, sponsor in the House. She did a lot of work to push it. We're super grateful to her for um, everything she did on this piece of legislation, but unfortunately it did die in the Senate. So again, similar to the agro reform, another piece of legislation that we're really gonna be pushing for in 2024 and that we hope we can finally get across the finish line because again, these are just very, these are basic privacy protections that everyone should be afforded, especially students, especially if they're being, you know, um, if they have to complete their education on these electronic devices that the school is giving them. So that's school computer privacy. The next piece of legislation is one that I'm actually gonna ask Representative Cruz to go over, which uh, I also think is really interesting. I'm excited to hear you talk about this. I was excited as a, as a first, first time representative legislator to come in and be able to sponsor this bill that's been coming back, um, but it's really important. So ending prison German is basically um, counting people who are incarcerated at our adult correctional institution in their home communities, their last known address in their home communities. And this is really about equal representation because there, there can be anywhere up to 2,200 people that are held at the ACI and they're counting them as residents as they live, and that's their home in, at the prison, the cage in which they're held at, which when they are released, they're going back to their home community. So this is really about a basic principle of equal representation. So when we're talking about counting people from their communities, that they're counted there, that resources are diverted there, um, especially at the time of census when that happens. Um, 
11 other states have ended this practice, so we know um, it, it, it disproportionately impacts people of color in those communities. So when we think about Rhode Island, people from Providence, Pawtucket, Central Falls, Woonsocket, and in high you know, poverty areas as well. So we wanna make sure that people are counted in the communities in which they come from and that those resources can be diverted there. And again, they don't use any resources in Cranston. They don't send their children there. They can't access any resources, but essentially what's happening now is they're counted as individuals living there and receiving resources. So I think this is really a, a premise about equal representation and fairness, and, and definitely too because it disproportionately impacts um, people of color in our state. Um, unfortunately, the bill received a hearing but had not come back, so it was held for further study this legislative session. But as talking as a legislator to others who sat on that committee and uh, some of my House representative colleagues had very favorable response that yes, let's get it done. And that's the thing here is you'll hear some pushback, you know, we've got 10 years till the next census, or you know, we have some time, but really the point is let's do it now um, so we're not wasting time and committee and resources continuing to hear this and let's get it on the books and end it and you know become the 12th state and end it completely um, here in our country. Um, and again, yeah, just hoping to push that back and I know as a first time legislator, it's important to have as many people too, if this is an issue so, you know, people care about that we really need others other than the, you know, the usual suspects who are up there every day advocating and, and testifying and submitting testimony on hundreds and hundreds of bills that we really need to hear from others and to make sure they know it is a priority, not just from the legislators who are making sure that everyone has equal representation in our state. Amazing. Thank you so much, Rep. Cruz, and also thank you for championing this bill as its sponsor this year. Thank you so much for all of your hard work on this legislation. Um, the next piece of legislation we're going to talk about is actually two pieces of legislation, so I buried the lead a little there, but um, very topical, uh, very relevant to a lot of, uh, shall we say, issues that you may be seeing in other states around the country, <laughs> and another really important piece of proactive legislation that we unfortunately saw die this year. So I'll ask uh, Steve to briefly talk about this again. Thanks. Uh, unfortunately, it's not just in other places around the country. It is in Rhode Island, too. Um, you may have heard or been aware about uh, uh, what happened in Westerly. Uh, there was an attempt to remove some books from the library, and in fact, uh, the librarian uh, was uh, on the receiving end of somebody filing a criminal complaint against them with the Attorney General's office, uh, arguing that uh, they were in violation of obscenity laws um, for having some books in, in the library. Um, as a result of that controversy, um, a legislator put in a bill, uh, Representative Morales uh, put in a bill to explicitly provide protection to libraries and librarians, uh, make it explicit that um, their work was not obscene um, and that they were not, they, did, they didn't have to worry about being charged under the state's obscenity laws for simply doing what all good librarians do. Um, uh, interestingly, Rhode Island is the only state in New England that does not have that explicit protection in, in, the, in our obscenity laws. Um, so there, uh, although I think it would be very hard to, to actually charge a librarian based on the laws that exist now, um, the threat was made and it made sense to put in a bill to make absolutely clear that this was not allowable under our laws. Uh, perhaps more interesting is that a week or two after that, in direct response to Representative Morales' bill, a legislator from Westerly put in a, a competing bill that made explicit that librarians were subject to the obscenity law. Um, so there was, a, there was a very interesting uh, legislative hearing on, on both of those bills. Um, there were people from Westerly, including the librarian and the person who had filed the complaint against the librarian there to, to testify. Um, the end result was that both bills died. Uh, they did not get uh, they did not get a vote, uh, so the status quo remains. Um, but I expect that you know this is not a problem that's going away anytime soon, um, and I certainly expect that uh, the legislation designed to provide uh, some very basic protections to librarians so they can do their job without fear um, will get reintroduced, and we'll be back there strongly supporting it. 
definitely a that was definitely a really interesting hearing. <laughs> um, people don't think that the legislature is interesting. Isn't interesting? They're very wrong. <laughs> Especially if they've been at that hearing, they would have been convinced. Um, so those were just some of the good bills that died, but there were also a lot of bad bills that died. A lot of bills that the ACLU actually lobbied against, um, urged that they die in committee, uh, that thankfully didn't pass this year. So we're just gonna talk about a few of those. I'm gonna ask uh, Representative Jello to start us off with a really interesting voting rights legislation, which this bill is really interesting to me, so I'm excited to hear what you have to say about it. Well, voting rights is, is, is not what it was about. It, this legislation was introduced on behalf of the Board of Elections. And what it would have done is require that to be counted uh, as write-in votes in order to be counted, write-in votes in order to be counted, the candidate had to register so many days before the election that they were mounting a, a write-in effort to be the next representative in District 1 or whatever. Um, and the, the reason that the Board of Elections gave for wanting to do this was that it was time consuming and of no worth, they said, to count write-in votes that sometimes are for Mickey Mouse or <laughs> Donald Duck or whoever, but not serious votes. And um, you know, thinking about it for a while, there are those Donald Duck and Mickey Mouse votes, I guess, every year. But there are also people who truly don't want to vote for either of the choices and want to make their thinking known more than just not voting that way. They may want to write in you know, Barry Schiller's name. <laughs> for representative in North Providence. And um, I thought, the ACLU thought, some of us in the House thought that election day is for the voters. And it's for the voters to have their say, whether they want to vote for candidate A or candidate B, or whether they want to vote, write someone in. And if they want to write someone in, they truly mean to do that and want that vote to be counted. Well, um, a majority of the members of the House did not agree with me on that. A majority of the members of the House thought, let's make it easier for, board, for the Board of Elections. And I have a kind of a sneaking suspicion that I'll share with all of you that, um, that Many of many elected officials, people in politics, want to be nice and want to be on the good side of boards of canvassers and the board of elections. And so, if the board of elections is asking to pass something to make it easier for their job easier for them, a lot of a lot of politicians seem to want to do that to make it easier. So anyhow, it passed the house but I guess it didn't pass the Senate. So yeah. that's, yeah, I suspect that the Board of Elections will try again. Because I, I, don't, I don't think they're as, as embarrassed as I am think they should be mm -hmm. doing this. Thing. Taking away what's supposed to be the Voters Day Election Day. If I can, if I can just add two quick things about that. First, Edie deserves a lot of credit. Um, it was actually a very close vote on the House floor, which virtually never happens. Um, you know, votes are usually you know, 68 to two, and yeah. this one was close. It was 35 to 26 or yeah. 27. It was, it, was, it was a very close vote, and it was thanks to people like Representative Magello, you know, speaking out against and convincing a lot of legislators that, that it was bad. So I, I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, thank you so much for talking about that bill and thank you also for your advocacy on this bill. But yeah, that was that was definitely one of those bills that was good to see die, um, that we were happy to see die, and again, really thankful for the advocacy that we saw in the House against this bill. Um, there was another, so another uh, bill that actually died was one that cropped up in the, in the remaining seconds of 
the uh, legislative session this year, which I'm going to ask uh, Steve to talk about. Another another thrilling turn of events at the end of the session. That yes, uh, well, thank you. Uh, this is a great example of why Hannah and I are there at the State House until the very last minute, until the gavel comes down and, <laughs> and they really have adjourned for the year. Um, this is a this was a, um, a a housing bill, one of the many housing bills that. Um, was being considered by the House and Senate this year, almost all of which passed. Um, and at uh, 8.56 p.m., uh, the last night of the session, a floor amendment was proposed to one of these housing bills. Uh, and the proposal was to limit um, dwellings from having uh, more than five unrelated people um, living there. Um, this was this is was and is in direct response to a lot of controversy that's gone on for years, decades in Narragansett with students. This is obviously aimed at student housing. Um, we have filed a number of lawsuits over the years uh, with mixed results, uh, challenging these types of laws and ordinances. Um, but this was a last-minute sort of last-ditch effort. Um, to try to get it codified into law. So Narragansett didn't have to keep on trying to pass ordinances, which kept on getting struck down um, when they tried to restrict uh, the housing. Um, but there it was, at, uh, as I said, you know, right before 9 p.m., suddenly this floor amendment appeared. Um, we saw it, um, we talked to some people very quickly. Um, it did pass the House, uh, although that too was a close vote. Uh, there were a number of legislators who got up on the floor and raised concerns about it. Uh, fortunately, it did die in the Senate. Uh, I think certainly it coming at the last minute helped um, with its demise. But uh, as I said at the beginning, I think it was a, it's a perfect example of how you always have to be vigilant. Um, things can crop up at any time, and it's really important to be there to be able to respond. And this was one we were able to respond to, and, and it had a happy ending, at least for this year. Yeah. <laughs> Until 2024, it's going nowhere, That's <laughs> and right. hopefully 2024 and beyond, if we have anything to say about it. Um, so there was also another piece of legislation that I'm going to ask Representative Cruz to speak about, which um, an important piece of, again, anti-criminal justice legislation that thankfully died in the Senate as well. Yes, this is around mandatory minimums, and I think Rhode Island, we've done a lot of work to, oh, sorry about that. In Rhode Island, we've done a lot of work to have justice reinvestment to try to reduce the population because at the ACI because it's costly. It's very costly. And when you think about mandatory minimums, um, particularly in Rhode Island, because we have something called a 32F, um, if somebody violates what a mandatory minimum, just to go back, it takes really the discretion from the judge to the prosecutor. And um, what that does is it's like a one size fits all. So really, um, this piece of legis legislation that came in really was trying to increase penalties but under mandatory mi minimum. So where if someone came forth with a charge, um, it really, and they were convicted, it really took all of that discretion to look at the individual, the circumstance, anything around that, and to make a determination on sentencing. It was just a one flat sentence. And, and in this case, it went from like 10 to 15 years and another one to five years. So it really put someone you know, in a place where we're gonna have, again, this costly bur burden of incarceration that we've worked so hard on, taking that discretion from the judge and not seeing the individual and the circumstances around it. But also then I'll go back to the violation, which I thought was really, really, you know, hard for me to look at is that in violations of probation and parole and understanding <coughs> the interaction or intersect with um, mandatory minimums here on Rhode Island, that's also a prosecutorial too, where it has people really plead out to a charge they may not be guilty of because they're faced with, say, a probation sentence of, say, five years, that if they're picked up on any additional charge, they're held at the ACI without bail, and they really are given the choice to plead and go home and increase your probation or parole sentence, or take it and serve out that time. So it really, it really gives people in this dilemma, right, to make a choice to go home today and take something you may not be guilty of, 
or serve that sentence. Um, and I saw so many intersects with mandatory minimums and the struggles here in Rhode Island that we you know, worked really hard on the ACLU around justice reinvestment, also you know, prison impact statements we think about and the costs that would have. So this was a really troubling bill. Um, I think, you know, in, in committee, we were very close to really, you know, voicing our concerns. We know there's already lengthy sentences. Judges already give them out for these. So to require a mandatory minimum and take that discretion away and give it to the prosecutor was even more troubling and really was contradictory to what we've been working on in our state. Um, it did It did pass on the, on the House floor. Um, it did not make it over to the Senate. Um, but again, this is this is something you know really concerning and we want to work towards um, is to make sure we move away from these types of legislation and laws in our state and really look at the whole person around discretion too and, and obviously reducing the cost of incarceration here in our state. Thank you. Thank you so much and thank you again for your advocacy on that bill. Um, there were a lot of, you know, a lot of, uh, I think there were a lot of objections in the House that helped lead to it dying in the Senate. I, so. did, I did want to just add to, I, I'm so fortunate to come into the House with, you know, champions like Rep. Agello, um, who sat, sat on that committee with me as well, but knowing that there's more and more um, representation in the House and the Senate that we're starting to think, you know, being more thoughtful about these things, not looking at it as <coughs> really the implications, um, you know, that are unintended, and talking about those, and then standing, you know, our ground. And I think, you know, I, I feel fortunate to be able to serve alongside, you know, someone who's a civil, a, a civil libertarian hero to me is Rep. Jello, and, and really stands strong. And I know as a mentor in that. So I want to thank Edie as well and on these these hard votes that trying to make people understand and, and see the deeper issue here. So thank you. Yeah. I yeah, I think we but we can't thank you enough for both of your advocacy. So and thank you for <coughs> your work on this bill especially. Um so the last piece of legislation, well package of legislation kind of that we're gonna talk about to conclude the section on the bad bills that died is actually a few pieces of legislation which again uh, mirrored some of the bills that we've also seen introduced across the country um, they were also introduced in rhode island which aimed to involve parents in curricular and educational decisions in ways that were not only really censorious but contrary to very important principles of public education um, the right for parents to be engaged in education and to know what their students are learning is important it's constitutionally protected but the provisions of these bills specifically really could have only been implemented in the most arbitrary of ways. Um, to give just a few examples from what these bills could have done, um, one of them would have actually barred uh, providing requested health services to minors unless parental consent is obtained, uh, which we were very concerned could lead to minors avoiding really important health care like psychological services or sexual health services, which under most circumstances they should be able to really independently access. Um, another bill would have very confusingly required that all sides of any topic be taught, which we were, of course, very concerned about. Um, you know, there are a lot of extremely concerning examples that could fall under that. Uh, perhaps one of the sillier ones is, for example, requiring that flat earth theory be taught along with basic earth sciences and geography. Um, you know, that may be a really silly example, but it's also very concerning um, and really should not be something that we are requiring by statute to happen. Um, and one of the bills would have also prohibited resources which, quote, center any race, ethnicity, gender, religion, or viewpoint. Um, which is not only incredibly vague and amorphous, um, but Frankly, it's hard for me to think of literally any uh, resource or educational material or book or movie or um, even song which could be taught under those restrictions. Um, I can't really think of any piece of writing that doesn't have a viewpoint. Um, so there are a lot of, not only was the, not only was the language of these bills really confusing, but they also clearly were aimed um, to make it impossible for schools to teach about our country's history of discrimination, which is um, 
of the most concern. So we lobbied against these bills. Thankfully, they died in committee. Um, if they come up again next year, we will certainly oppose them again. Uh, but one of the kind of, I don't want to say good things about this, but usually when these bills come up in committee, you do get a lot of opposition from the committee members. Um, this is kind of one of those one of those one of those packages of legislation where as you're in the hearing you know kind of exactly what's going to happen um, where you get uh, 99 percent to 100 percent of committee members saying i will never vote for this so um these bills did die i think again it's important to talk about just kind of like the library of sanity protections just to remind people that you know we see a lot of headlines about states across the country about really concerning anti-civil liberties legislation that's introduced it also does happen in Rhode Island, um, and we do actively oppose them. So again, thankfully they died. If they are introduced next year, we will, we will lobby against them again. Uh, but that does conclude our section on the bad bills that died. Oops. Um, next, we're going to turn actually to Steve to talk about one of the really, I think, profound um, missed legislative opportunities that we saw again this year. So. Steve, you want to take it away? Sure. Uh, well, this was the fourth legislation, uh, fourth legislative session um, since George <coughs> Floyd died, um, and in the years uh, since that, um, legislators across the country have been grappling with the need to pass legislation to rein in police misconduct. Um, and if you look at what other states have done, uh, there have been all sorts of different bills passed to address that issue. Here in Rhode Island, unfortunately, despite the passage of four sessions, there's really no um, police reform legislation that has passed in those years. Um, one of the most prominent ones is um, the so-called Leobor Bill, the Law Enforcement Officer Bill of Rights, um, where there have been efforts to try to either repeal or reform it. Um, this is a law that provides incredible protections to police officers to uh, prevent police chiefs from disciplining them um, for often very serious misconduct. Um, as you know, I mention every time I testify on the bill, the Law Enforcement Officer Bill of Rights provides greater procedural protections to police officers facing administrative sanctions than a criminal defendant facing life in prison. Um, it's, it's absolutely unconscionable, um, but that's the fact. Um, there were lots of efforts to really try to get a bill passed this year. I have to say, a lot of people were working on it, um, but it just did not get together in the end, um, and the bill died. I think a lot of people expected some version of Leobor reform to pass this year, but it did not. I'm, I'm fairly confident, although I was fairly confident this year would happen, that next year there will be some version of it to pass. You know, the question is how strong it will be. You know, that I can't say. I will certainly be watching it closely, um, but uh, I do think that some type of reform uh, of the Leobor uh, statute will pass. Um, that was just one of a number of police reform bills, however, that died in the session. Another one, sort of a companion one, would have established a process for decertifying officers who had engaged in misconduct. Uh, Rhode Island is one of only two states in the country that does not have a police decertification process. Um, and a bill was introduced to uh, try to reduce that to one state. Uh, unfortunately, that bill also went nowhere. Um, a third police reform bill that um, the ACLU has been um, working on for a number of years, um, that has on a number of occasions passed the Senate to die in the House. This year didn't pass either um, body. Uh, had to do with providing protections to juveniles um, interrogated by police um, to ensure that a, um, uh, either a parent or attorney was present uh, when police began interrogating uh, an individual. Uh, we have a former senator here, Senator Anderson, who, who uh, pushed that bill for us uh, and got it passed in, in the Senate last year. Um, uh, but uh, this year it died, and you know, this is another bill that uh, uh, we'll, be, we'll be bringing you back next year. One final one, again, there are a number of police reform bills I could mention, but the, the one final one I'll mention is another one that we were strongly pushing, and that was legislation to try to set some standards and restrictions on the use of automated license plate readers, uh, which is another issue we've been working on for a number of years. Uh, these are incredibly invasive of privacy in terms of the 
data they are able to collect on people as they travel around the state. Um, the bill that was proposed would have set some, what we think are very reasonable limits. It didn't ban them, it just uh, set up some guardrails on how these cameras could be used. Uh, not surprisingly, there was a lot of opposition from the police. Um, but this is another issue we'll be back next year to work on. Um, but again, I just want to you know, end by saying just how disappointing it is. You know, regardless of which bill you look at, um, it's really unfortunate that after all this time, there really have been no, uh, no evident police reform legislation passed in this state. You know, we're going to be pushing until, until we do get some. And that was actually one of, the, one of the reasons that we kind of singled this issue out was because I think especially in the context of the last four years, this really was a very profoundly disappointing, um, I know for both advocates and many, many, many legislators, a very profoundly disappointing um, lack of movement on a lot of these really important bills that we have so many advocates working on, so many legislators who are proponents of, um, but Again, rest assured, at least I can guarantee the four of us up here will continue to work on that. So uh, thank you so much, Steve. And I'm actually gonna ask uh, Representative Angelo to talk about another really important piece of legislation that she sponsored this year that unfortunately also um, died, but that also was would have been really important in the context of, um, again, this police reform legislation. Um, what this legislation does is restart a study and collection of data that we did for four years or so um, and ended a couple, several years ago. But this study looked at police traffic stops and the perceived race of the driver and others in the car, whether the, why, the, why the car was stopped, whether the car was searched, if they found any, if any contraband was found. Um, one of the things that I found most interesting <coughs> in just a little bit that I had heard about the prior study was that um, targeting, well first of all, blacks are, were stopped more frequently than their numbers in whatever community would indicate. So they were stopped more often. Um, that raises an eyebrow, at least it should. Um, but what they found looking at it was they were much more likely to find contraband in the cars driven by white people that were stopped than black people. So the racial profiling wasn't even working to account to account criminals. Anyhow, trying to get that data collection going again, there is federal money from the Federal Highway Department to pay for collection of the data and examination of the data. And this legislation also would set up a committee of people to look at the results, look at the data, and um, talk about it. So we know where we are because Clearly, at the end of the study, we were not in a better place than we were at the beginning of the study, and we pretty much all probably think that we're not in a better place now than we were four years ago regarding that. So, we'll be working on that again next year. Thank you also again for your sponsorship of this important bill. I think, I think this bill is also really interesting because it's one that literally was law um, until uh, July 2020. So definitely really frustrating to see something that was a part of our statute that then um, sunsetted, uh, essentially went out of effect, and then to have such a kind of a struggle to get it reinstated. It's definitely um, another one of those really frustrating as aspects of that lack of action on police reform this year. So again, thank you for your sponsorship and your advocacy on this really important bill. Um, so we also thought it could be interesting to throw in one that was technically a bad bill that passed, but through our lobbying, we made less bad. So <laughs> I'm gonna ask um, Representative Cruz to talk about this one. <laughs> less bad. Yeah, <laughs> like, I don't know what the correct adjective no, is for that. that but, uh, <laughs> less bad. So this was the um, self storage. So we know about the self storage units in our city, they're popping up. Um, for me, um, 
when I saw this bill, well, first of all, for me, I work with families, um, and we, we're in a housing crisis. So I have a lot of families who are using self-storage units because they found themselves you know, homeless, they love the housing, they couldn't afford rents. So all of their belongings are in these self-storage units. So um, I saw this bill in committee, um, which came really quick and fast, which I was like, okay, what is this? And it was reducing the notification requirements mm -hmm. to let someone know if they default or if they're late on a payment. It was reducing the amount of time of notification. So if you missed a payment, it was reducing that amount of time um, of notification to get that payment. Also, how they're notifying you. Um, it was by certified mail. There was like a three-week circulation in a newspaper. So there was a lot of, you know, I mean, it, it could be better, but at the way it came, <laughs> or at least what was there prior to the proposing, there was some notification requirements so that if someone defaulted, um, they were going to sell their stuff or, or throw it away. So basically, they were curbing back on some of the notification requirements um, to let people know, hey, you're in default, we're about to sell your things, and they're gone. Um, and again, I think this was really troubling because these were people's belongings, everything they owned, um, especially as they were experiencing homelessness and were in this housing crisis, that this bill hit our committee. It was really close, I think, um, again, bringing up you know, the concerns, the ACLU, as far as you know, those, those notification processes, how they're needed, um, how important they are. Um, and also knowing that when it came, it was hitting the floor within a couple of days. So we knew we didn't have much time, but here it is, and how do we try to make it better? Or how do we try to make it less bad because we know how important it was? And, and again, like I said, this was, this was really troubling to see. I was surprised it even came, especially considering where we are. But, you know, taking away, you know, one of the things that was interesting was, you know, the newspaper. Also, on the rental agreement, there, there was an email address and then a website where you can check. They were taking that notification away. Um, the certified mail, I mean, it, it was very, and also you had 30 days and they were going down to 20 days. So there was, they were really, you know, really ramping up on taking away a lot of your rights as far as notification. So we were able to do some things, <laughs> um, but it ended up passing, it was close. Um, it was really close. I, I really thank a lot of my colleagues in the General Assembly because we, we had less than 48 hours to kind of rally people, you know, ask, you know, some of leadership and House Representatives, can we make some changes? Here are some of these things. And we're able to get, you know, some changes in the final hours. Um, but really to a lot of people who, who were like, I don't want this either. We were able to rally a lot of um, fellow representatives to really push that, yeah, we're not gonna vote for it if, if we can't make this better or less bad, <laughs> which is the best term. Um, so it did pass um, with some of the, you know, less bad amendments, but again, we were concerned and we, we you know, noted it on the floor, like, this is still not good, um, but, you know, we're thankful that some changes were made to, you know, make it a little better than what was proposed, so. Yeah. Less bad is the uh, I, official, no, it's the bad. official legal term that was for what we did to that. that. <laughs> you stayed to the final hours yeah. that came. I was, I, I was really surprised because I saw bills took a lot of time and this one went really fast. Yeah. And I was really surprised about it, so. Thank you so much for talking about that bill. I think this is also, again, one of those pieces of legislation that I think is, um, even though uh, self-storage units may not on the surface be fascinating to talk about, <laughs> One of those issues that does become a lot more interesting and also um, really urgent and important when you look at it through the lens of civil liberties. So I, I think that this is not only a great example of um, the efforts that you put in, but also kind of how expansive, again, the issues that civil liberties touches are. Um, so the good news is that it wasn't just that everything died this year. It wasn't just that there were bad things that were made, um, again, in the professional legal term, less bad. Um, but we also had some really exciting civil liberties victories, one of which is a testament to the legacy of work that Representative Agello has uh, done for 
decades and that I'm really excited to have her um, introduce and talk about. Thank you, Hannah. And thank you, Hannah, and, and, and thank you all. This, this, is, this was an uh, effort of so many people in the state of Rhode Island and so many of my prede predecessors in the House of Representatives. And anyhow, we passed the Equal Access to Abortion Care Act. Or finish off the work that we did in 2019 with codifying Roe v. Wade. And now um, people in the state of Rhode Island who have Medicaid or are state employees and have state employee health insurance, their um, abortion care will be covered. Um, there was the big argument against it was that taxpayers will be paying for for something that they don't approve of. And um, on the floor, I tried to point out some other things that, um, that, <laughs> that lots of us don't approve of, but some of our tax money goes to that. Um, but anyhow, it passed, it is now law, um, state employees and Medicaid recipients will have their abortion care covered by insurance just like other employees and health insurance. We, we've, we've finished the package, and um, uh, Anastasia Williams, in her last year in the House, or no, in 2019, when she introduced the Reproductive Privacy Act, this, this was part of that. So she had brought that issue forward in 2019 with the thought we were getting a lot and we did get a lot when we codified Rome. So we kind of finished that this year. And did it early, didn't wait till the very end of the session. So that was a relief to lots of us. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just want to say something about Hannah and, and Steve and the, and the um, volunteers with the ACLU. I, you know, lobbyists, in public get a really bad name. Hannah and Steve and maybe John Marion with Common Cause give lobbyists a really good name. They come to the State House prepared, prepared, they know what they're talking about, They um, and they educate legislators. Um, they, they are invaluable to the state of Rhode Island to our good government. I, I don't know what we would do without them, really. So I would like to call <laughs> Thank you. That's so nice. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> I'm like emotional because we're talking about this bill. I'm emotional because what you just said. Thank you. You the heart. That was too. so nice of you. <laughs> um, well, I get the pleasure of talking about one more victory, um, which is our final bill of the evening before we move to questions, um, which was another really big civil liberties victory that we saw this year, which was a very exciting win for workers' rights. Um, this legislation actually amends the Rhode Island Fair Employment Practices Act to prohibit an employer from requiring as a condition of, an employ of employment that an employee enter into a non-disclosure or non-disparagement agreement. Uh, the reason that this is so important is because it really just represents a step forward in addressing attempts um, by employers to stifle the rights of victims of discrimination, to speak out about misconduct that they experienced in the workplace, um, especially since, uh, unfortunately, and far too often, the use of these agreements as a condition of employment has shielded employers from scrutiny for, for uh, discriminatory or harassing actions or policies. So. We strongly supported this bill. We lobbied in favor of it for many years. Uh, so this was also a very exciting win to see it passed this year. Um, a very important uh, step forward for workers' rights. So um, it wasn't just that bills died. There were some really important victories. Um, so happy about the EACA. So happy about this piece of legislation. 
And I'm sure you're also wondering now, how can you get involved in this legislative process? How can you also talk about all of these important topics that you've learned about tonight? Um, I'm sure you're eager to call and uh, email every single elected official you have now. <laughs> and we would really encourage that. The first thing that we would say is that now is the time to contact your representatives and senators, voice your support for civil liberties positive bills, your opposition to bad bills. Um, I think that if anything, you know, one of the takeaways from this evening is that because so many of these good bills died, um, we really do need a lot of that support from the community to help push these really important civil liberties bills forward. It really does make a difference. Um, I'm sure that the legislators we have in our panel and in our audience can also attest to that, which is that constituent engagement is really important to making sure that these really important issues either are passing or, um, or on the contrary, also dying. <laughs> so um, those are really important. The second thing is that you can learn how to lobby with us. We have a number of resources on our website. We have a whole Advocacy 101 toolkit on our website that you can find. Um, and we also have a yearly legislative advocacy training that we would love to, uh, seven months in the future, invite you all to. Um, we usually hold those in January or February of um, the year. and right when the legislative session is getting started. So you have a lot of opportunities to work on a lot of bills that are just getting introduced, that haven't even had hearings yet. You can learn how to lobby, you can go to those hearings, you can testify at the State House. I would love to see you there. Um, I get so excited when I see people who came to our legislative advocacy trainings then at the State House. Like I literally use those right now. It's like there's, I mean there's no better feeling for me, but I hope there's no better feeling for you as well <laughs> to be up there and to be engaged um, in the civic process. And then the last thing that you can do is register for our email list for bill alerts and updates uh, when the legislative session does get started again in seven months. I'm sure all of us are uh, not ready to think about that quite yet, but January will come around again eventually. It can't be stopped. Um, we have an email sign-up list on our back table if you'd like to put your email there before you leave. Um, please do so and we'll, we'll make sure that you're getting updates about what's happening during the legislative session as it happens. And now we can move to questions. So. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the four of you. Uh, I'm, I'm an occasional uh, volunteer on environmental issues uh, as a lobbyist. And whenever I see any of you uh, from the ACLU, I'm always so glad you're watching them uh, and, and helping them understand. Um, and Steve probably remembers that I occasionally disagree with an ACLU position. I don't have any disagreement this time, but I do have a question. So there was a bill that pertained to the state and federal constitution that you didn't mention, and that was our constitutional right in the state to access and use the shoreline, and there's a federal constitutional right to have your property not seized without compensation. So I'm wondering what your take is on the question of the shoreline access and the, uh, the bill that passed and the prospects going forward with the inevitable lawsuit against them. Uh, our take is we have no take on it. Um, if you were at the hearings, you did not uh, see us testify. It is a complicated issue from a civil liberties perspective. And at least at this point, we've, we've taken no position on it. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you for all you do. And my question is about the Abortion Coverage Act. How close was it? And uh, in terms of people who were on the fence, what arguments do you think were most persuasive on the floor? Um, that's a good question. Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. And I was, I have to say, I was surprised at the margin of victory in the House and, and in the Senate, too. And I was surprised that some opponents of abortion um, actually voted for it and supported it. Um, maybe the biggest example is the Senate President, Dominic Rosario. Um, voted for it and supported it because they saw it as a matter of equity. Um, that if if we didn't do this, um, people who are very low income and therefore on Medicaid would not have access to an abortion. And state employees would not, simply because they were state employees. So uh, some people who have 
not supported abortion rights, supported this bill because they saw it as an issue of equity. Um, and as I said, I don't remember what the margin was, but it was bigger than I thought. Yes. Yes. Hi. Um, I'm a retired educator, and I wanted to ask about the student privacy bill that didn't pass because it addresses privacy for um, students at home or, or you know, uh, with regard to schools, but I wonder if, if that bill addresses at all a privacy in terms of from external uh, entities as well, because I, I was the recipient of an early uh, bomb, you know, a, a Zoom bomb uh, in, in a professional conference that was absolutely terrible. And, you know, just, uh, you know, it was um, obscene. I mean, we're really talking about obscene pictures coming up, and it took a long time for us to figure out how to stop it. That was when Zoom was really getting off the ground. So I wonder if that bill could um, also address that type of an issue in terms of security for um, computers, the software that protects against those types of things, or training for teachers that would then be able to um, train, you know, know how to deal with those issues, because that is real. And it goes beyond just the schools. It, it goes to the entire internet. Yeah, no, thank you so much for that question. And I think, so I think actually your question is really interesting because it's true that this is a bill that addresses a very discreet part of student privacy. Um, you know, uh, the, the security aspect that you're talking about is also clearly another huge issue. Another issue that this bill doesn't address is, um, you know, the, the privacy that students have from maybe like third party apps, um, going in and seeing what's in a student's email and using that to uh, develop marketing tools. I mean, even though there are a lot of different laws that are kind of like, there's a lot of <laughs> legislative, there's not a lot of, uh, there's not a ton of very comprehensive um, <laughs> privacy uh, legislation federally or statewide, as I'm sure everyone in this room is aware. Um, but there are definitely a lot of different aspects that were unaddressed by this bill that could have. The short answer is that this bill is actually a compromise version um, from the input of many, many stakeholders. This was one of the, this, these were the aspects of the bill that we um, had the most support on. Um, there are so many different issues of student privacy that the ACLU is really interested in pursuing and interested in pushing legislation on, especially in the future, um, kind of as next steps. So in the same way that we had the Reproductive Privacy Act passed in 2019, and then we had the, um, the EACA passed just this last year, um, we kind of have like a long-term plan for student privacy legislation that's inclusive of a lot of those issues. But for this one in particular, um, the short answer is just that this was a compromise bill where this was the type of policy that we had the most agreement on at the time and that we felt would be um, kind of the first and the first, uh, I don't want to say easiest, but like the, the best first push towards making sure that we're getting some of those protections in state law. So that's a great question. Um, and oops, I don't know about the. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, that was really uh, very topical. <laughs> Maybe we also need to be pushing a piece of legislation for yeah, exactly for PowerPoints in a public library. Um, but yeah, so that's the that's the long answer, and then also the short answer. And I, I'll, I'll sign up for the email so I can get yeah. This. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Yes. What's your analysis as to why we don't understand you make it out of committee? Um, sorry, I couldn't hear the question. Oh, yeah. What is your analysis as to why the gun legislation didn't make it out of committee? That's, it's, it's a hard question to answer straight. Um, the gun bills in the House had a majority a clear majority of co-sponsors. 
on the safe storage bill and on the assault weapons bill. Um, there seems to be a lack of appetite to address what some people think of as con controversial bills when the House is not sure the Senate will pass it or the Senate's not sure that the House will pass it. And I think that that's the issue here. Um, I, I think we just have to keep pushing and voters, they, they, Moms Demand Action and the, the other group, name escapes me at the moment, but those, those groups are very active at the State House. On the other hand, um, the NRA and the Second Amendment Coalition are also active. And I, thinking back to this past General Assembly session, someone asked me a couple of weeks ago about the, the gun bills. And, and when I thought about it, I realized that the, the men in the yellow shirts um, the Second Amendment guys, and they, they all wear yellow shirts, so you sort of feel like you're surrounded by bumblebees or something. But, but um, more testosterone than bumblebees. But um, anyhow, um, they weren't there, really, this year. And I somehow think they knew they didn't need to be. Otherwise, I would think they would have been there. So, I don't know. Um, I, my only answer is, you know, with these things that are hard, keep pushing. Other questions? So for the third year in a row, several Central Falls legislators introduced bills that appear to have language targeting the why. They didn't make it for this year. Um, I was wondering if maybe you could talk a little bit as to why you, what's your perspective on why they didn't make it through, and what are their chances for next year? Um, I, I, I can't answer the second question at all. Um, I, I don't know. Um, they, um, uh, there, are a variety, there are a variety of bills that have been introduced, um, some that are designed to actually just close the wide completely, um, others to set limits on um, what they can do. I mean, we have, the ACLU has a history with Wyatt. Um, we have uh, argued that um, why it should not be a place for uh, immigrant detainees. Um, we have, have a very unfortunate history of representing the family of a young gentleman who died while he was in the care of Wyatt um, and died completely unnecessarily and in <coughs> complete agony um, because of the way Wyatt treated him. Um, but there's, uh, there, there's all this litigation going on, as you know, um, that makes closing it very complicated. Um, in fact, there was a brief effort by uh, the, the city itself to um, get out from some of the contracts uh, dealing with the Wyatt. Um, there are bondholders uh, from here to the other end of the country. Uh, uh, demanding money from Wyatt, um, which uh, it has generally not been making. So I, I just think there are a lot of uh, a lot of um, different interests uh, that are involved, and it makes it makes any legislative effort to address what is going on there very complicated from a legal perspective. wondering if the ACLU supported the Crown Act this year, and if you did, um, why do you think that it wasn't passed? Because I know there was a lot of talk about it, so I was just wondering. We strongly supported it um, and testified on it um, in both the House and the Senate. I don't know why it didn't pass. <laughs> um, I don't know if there's any... Unfortunately, that tends to be the answer a lot, is that you see, again, these really important and very critical pieces of legislation that um, don't go anywhere, and it's extremely hard to pinpoint why. What um, is this act? Sorry? What is this act? Oh, this is the Crown Act, so it would prohibit discrimination on the basis of uh, protected hairstyles. Okay. Yeah. Hairstyles. Hairstyles. 
Um, and I don't know if, yeah, I don't know if, if anyone has any insight about why it didn't pass, but yeah, definitely, again, one of those, one of those really important bills where it is really, again, very disappointing at the end of the session to see that it didn't go anywhere, especially because you don't have anyone uh, testifying in opposition to it. You have so many advocates who come year after year in favor of it. Um, I mean, we'll continue to lobby in favor of it and hopefully 2024. Um, but yeah, I wish I wish I had a reason why. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, of course. Exactly. Thank and you. I'm just thinking about who the sponsor was could have more insight because I know I definitely from my perspective, we had the votes. So it's, you know, again, what was that inside? Like Hannah's saying, you know, why not? Yeah. But I think it was uh, Rep Hennings, right? That's the sponsor. Yes. Mm. Yeah. My analysis is that the Reproductive Privacy Act passed in, was it 2018? 2019. 2019. Because of the amount of people that were there advocating for it at the State House every day, every morning before the sun came up. Um, and there were not enough people at the State House for the gun legislation or the, uh, probably the Crown legislation. We need more people at the State House yelling and screaming. Yeah, come to our lobby training. <laughs> Sometimes when you think something's a low hanging, you're like, of course, we have the votes. It's we still need people there to push in for the powers that be. You still need it, even if you think it's a no-brainer. It's going to you know pass, or you have the votes, right? Yeah, and you know, it, I think actually, t-shirt color. I talked about the men in the yellow shirts, but um, the pink shirts um, were a big part of the reproductive privacy effort and there were lots of days in 2019 when when the state house was full of mostly women wearing pink t-shirts and that's you know i think that that's maybe in a, in a while after a while it becomes intimidating to the men um but because the men seem to be in, in power but anyhow i i think you can have an impact by being at the state house and talking to your representative or senator, calling them on the phone, or being at the state house and you know just hanging out with the appropriate colored shirt, and um, you know that's noticed. And so there were not enough. There were I was not there as many. Two days I was there for the gun legislation. Mm -hmm. The orange shirts. Barely showed up to the Come to our lobbying training. <laughs> um, are there any other questions? Or oh yes, we'll probably make this the last one if that's okay. But we'll I'll share our contact information in a second. What's your process to triage bad bills? So I assume that there are bad bills that you look at and you you know the landscape. So you know this is never going to go anywhere. So that's okay. Or, or or is that the thought process? So like, how do you deal with bad bills and decide how scary the bad bills are and how to to deal with it? Well, do you want me to start this off, Steve? And then you can. Well, I think okay. That's a really good question. I mean, I think that also, like, I, I think one of the really important things that I would want to emphasize is that I don't think we ever treat bad bills lightly. Like, there may be bills where we'll look at them and say, this has a 2% chance of passing versus a bad bill that has like a 76% chance of passing. I mean, not that we ever calculate that, how can you? But um, I would say that at, we, I would say that we devote a very similar amount of energy to a lot of the bad bills, um, if not all of them, um, because you really never know, A, whether it might go somewhere, B, what it might get, um, sub, what, a, what it might get sub aid into, so like what substitute language might get put in that bill that becomes a concern later on, um, but also because I think it's just really important to kind of have a very, a very unified defensive strategy for these anti-civil liberties bills. Um, we at least are very, I think we're very, I think we're very, one of our like 
we don't really leave any of them behind. If it's a bad bill, we comment on it. Um, do, you, do you want to add to that, Steve? I feel like I gave a very <laughs> yeah, I, 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 well, broad. Really, yeah, there really isn't an answer. I mean, a lot of it is based on instinct. We've got, you know, certainly we do take into account how seriously should we treat this bill? Um, but as Hannah also said, one of the surprises of the General Assembly is bills pop up that you thought for sure were never going anywhere. Um, so uh, as she said, you really do have to keep an eye on, on everything. And um, there are obviously some bills that are much more important than others. Um, and you know, more energy is clearly going to be spent, but I would say probably Half the bills we spend a good amount of time on are ones we never would have thought we had to deal with and then become yeah. very important. Uh, you know, some yeah. bills we've talked about tonight, I mean, the self-storage bill, you know, that's not a bill that we would have thought, <laughs> oh, we really need to focus on this, but suddenly the bill comes out of committee in the last week of the session and we have to spend time on it. Yeah. And I think also, sorry, just to add one more thing briefly, is that we we try to be strategic, I think, as well about bills that we outright oppose um, because the principle of the bill is something that's antithetical to civil liberties and something we oppose. And then also bills that are bad but could be amended. Um, so I think we're also very deliberate a lot of times if we can, if we oppose a bill, um, we'll, our position will be like oppose slash amend. Um, so here's the one discrete part of the bill that we oppose you could fix it this way, we really think you should, and then we won't oppose it. So um, I think there's a lot of, it really depends on the bill, I guess is the long and short answer. Um, thank you so much for that question. I think since we're getting towards 7.30, I think um, we'll probably, oh no, I think my, oh there we go. It's like my security <laughs> breach was preventing me from going to my last slide. Um, <laughs> I just want to say thank you all to you all so much for coming out tonight. Um, it is really exciting to have our legislative wrap up again in person. Um, if you have any questions at all that you that we didn't answer, that you have lingering from this, please feel free to contact us. Um, we answer answer emails and phone calls constantly. We're always happy to answer your questions. Um, follow us on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram for updates on what we're doing. Um, but really, thank you so much. It's really exciting to see people engaged in this. It's exciting to see people engaged in civil liberties. Um, and we're really grateful to have you here. Also really grateful to our panels, to our panelists, uh, to Representative Agello, to Representative Cruz. Thank you for your sponsorship of so many of these bills, for your advocacy on so many of these bills, uh, for coming tonight to talk about these bills, even though I'm sure you're sick of talking about these bills. <laughs> um, but we really appreciate it. And then I just want to quickly invite um, our development associate uh, Monica Smith to come up very briefly for one final announcement before we conclude our evening. Not for the 10 minutes that I was told about. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. I promise you that. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. So I'm one of the newest people here at the ACLU. I've been here since April and this is my first in-person event. Is there anyone else here at their first in-person ACLU event? Oh, thank God, so I'm not the only one. If you had any nerves or anything, please know you're not alone. I'm happy to commiserate. It's been an amazing day uh, for me to sit here and learn and hear about this. Um, so as I said, I am the newest person. Uh, one of the things that I get the benefit of learning about is um, how much work happens behind the scenes in the community. Um, I'm a person in long-term recovery, and over 19 years ago, I experienced my last episode of homelessness. And this bill about storage might seem insignificant. Mm -hmm. However, I had to choose between storing my stuff at a known predatory storage center or with family and friends who may very well also get rid of it. Um, so like the work that is done at the ACLU, the work that we do and contribute at the State House, um, over six hundred hours in addition above and beyond of our regular work day goes into ensuring that our civil liberties and rights in Rhode Island are protected. That might not seem like much, however, these civil liberties and the bills that are passed at the State House trickle down into our schools, our libraries, they impact our children, they impact laws for recovery housing. Uh, what happens if you are destitute and lose everything? Everything that we do has a trickle-down effect, and I just want to thank you so much for being here and for learning about it so that you can take it back to 
to your neighbors and your friends and your community members and say, hey, do you know what the ACLU is doing? Hey, do you know how you can get involved? Not only can you give through our website within two clicks, you can write us a check, you can be present at our events, you can also uh, reach out to us to meet with us to think about how else can I contribute? What else can I do? If you have fears about showing up at the state house, me too, <laughs> me too, but I'm here. Like we, I'm happy to help talk you through that. I'm sure any of us would. So thank you for just being here today and being nervous with me, or at least helping me to reduce my nerves. I hope to see your faces in the future. We're gonna be doing a lot more public education. So please continue to come to these events so I can get to know you all so much better like they do. Thank you, everyone. I don't know if people know this, but my first experience, real experience at the State House was with the ACLU, was volunteering, was getting the trainings, what, and here I am today like what? <laughs> so I had that same fear of all the unknown. I, I didn't know, I was someone in my community who just wanted to, I started out with students and ending the school to prison pipeline, and that's how I got involved with the, with the ACLU, and, yeah. and going through all the trainings, and volunteering, and, and here I am just over a decade later as a, a state representative or a legislator. So it's really the impact that it has and, and the different impacts on everyone and why you you know volunteer, why you donate, why you go to the trainings, it really will be something personal for you. But I just wanted to share that as well. And now my first, I've moderated these panels as a volunteer and as my first panel, so thank you. I was very nervous. <laughs> Um, it, it just there's so much more to what you get out of being a part of this organization so please give please volunteer do what you can to keep this going and, and provide more hope in our state so thank you and thank you again for being here